Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's nearly the end of the week, so welcome to a special Thursday edition of the News Agenda with me, Fleet Street Fox. And today I'm joined by entrepreneur and ex-Dragon's Den star, James Kahn, for a special chat. And we're going to talk about something which is suddenly on the minds of about one and a half million people, perhaps two million by Christmas, which is how to land a job. But if coronavirus has left us with anything... I think it's a, a deep desire for things to be better after all this is over. So it's not just any job, but your dream job. Or if you found something even more rewarding, how to set up your own business in just seven days. And James has written books about both these things. So perhaps if you've been furloughed or fired, perhaps you want a career change, or have a little nugget of an idea about going it alone, this is the place to find out a bit more about it. Now, we're here to help. We want you to ask us questions throughout it. Dig into the comments. Ask us what you think um, you might want to do as a career change or as a job or have a business idea. Ask James his opinion. You've got an expert here. Let's use him. Uh, and meanwhile, as well, the Mirror is giving away some free copies of James's books on these very topics. And the links to the first of these books, uh, an ebook called Get the Job You Want, is pinned in the comments and it's also going to be displayed on the screen. It is uh, at, can you find it at mirror.co.uk slash Khan Job, C A A N Job. Uh, and you'll be able to find those in the links around here. Go there and you can get the download. But first, James, I'm going to break one of the cardinal rules you mentioned in this book about always asking sensible questions when you're in an interview situation. Uh, I know you're in Monaco and I know the sun is shining, but have you got anything you can tell us just to cheer us all up in rainy old Britain that you too have been affected by the pandemic? Uh, yes, I do. I mean, recently my daughter caught Corona and she's pregnant at the moment. And, you know, as a dad, I mean, that was really devastating to hear that uh, she was unwell. Um, so I think the pandemic, to be honest, has affected all of us. I don't think any of us have been immune. And, you know, she was out for nearly 10 days. Uh, and that was not a good experience, you know, as a dad, because, you know, I was super worried. Uh, but I'm pleased to tell you uh, that she's fully recovered and she's back on form. I spoke to her this morning. She went for a walk, took the dog for a walk. Um, and she's feeling way better. So that was my... Good you know, kind of difficult period during this time. Yeah. I said there's 10 days she was in hospital, was she? No, she at home. She quarantined at home. Um, and I thought, to be honest, it would have, you know, because she's quite young, I thought, it, you know, within four or five days she'd bounce back. Uh, but she was literally in bed for nearly 10 days, you know, with the shivers and the temperature. And uh, she lost her taste buds. Um, you know, just to check, she ordered some sushi on day eight and you know had a teaspoon of wasabi and thought it was butter and i was oh, like dear. wow it was really that bad um but you know by day 10 she started recovering she's feeling better so you know we spoke every day and you know i was genuinely worried because it's not you know it's not a great thing to catch um and because she was pregnant it made me even more worried yeah, of course, uh, but i'm right. delighted that you know she's back back on form back out walking and you know feeling good so Good. Excellent Good news. And a, and a reminder, it doesn't matter how wealthy or successful you are. This is going to, you know, what's going on is affecting everybody in lots of different ways. Now, James, you've had lots of work with startup loans and so on, handing them out to businesses who've got great new ideas. So I presume you're, if you were asked today what sort of business people should be setting up, you're probably not going to suggest that they go into a high street or hospitality or start running a theatre. So, you know, we've got this situation, where even when the pandemic's over, people are going to be working from home permanently. People are, you know, they're not going to be commuting as much. You don't want to go setting a coffee shop up at a train station right now. Um, so where do you see, what sector do you think we can't all work in cyber, can we? What What's the next big sector that's going to be booming in terms of jobs in the economy? I mean, I think it's a great question. And I think the answer is not an obvious one, because I think when you start a business, you don't follow somebody else's dream. Or I don't think you generally follow somebody else's idea. I think when you want to start a business, it's something you believe in. It's about you. And I think when I started my own business as a, in recruitment, I didn't do it because I saw somebody else doing it. I happened to be in recruitment. I thought, I really love this. I really enjoy this. I get a great kick out of this. And I'd love to have my own business. So I think when you start a business, I think it's about something that you believe in. It's your passion. It's your dream. And that's where you should start a business. Because 
businesses don't succeed because of the product. I don't even think business succeed because of a market. Businesses succeed because of the passion, the desire, the determination of the individual who drives it. So my advice would be that, you know, if you're looking to start a business, start something that means something to you that you think is important to you and you believe in because you'll be the one who's going to be executing and delivering on that idea. That's interesting. Uh, and it kind of goes into what James says here about what you would recommend to make the most profit out of a small business and what you should invest in, because it sounds like you're saying that the most important thing to invest in kind of is is almost yourself, that it's your the amount you're prepared to put into a business is what you will get out of it at the end. 100 percent. Absolutely. Yeah. 100 percent. Because I my motto is, you know, it is people who create success in business, not the idea. Okay. And if you were starting out today, then what would you, if you had, I don't know, £5,000, £10,000, what would you go and invest that in? What would you set up a new business doing right now? I mean, I think one of the things that I found a lot recently is I think a lot of people have been made, you know, redundant. And as we know, jobs are not easy to come by right now. And I think if I was looking to set up, I would set up a lifestyle business. So, you know, somebody came across recently that I thought was really clever where they lost their job and they were working in finance and credit control. And the company said, look, I'm, I'm really sorry, but, you know, business isn't great. We just can't afford to keep you on at the moment. And he said, look, I really understand that. And he said, I respect the fact I can't stay full time, but how about if I just do two days a week? And they said, oh, I'd never thought of that because he said, there's probably enough work for me because we're still trading we're, as much as not probably as much as before. So they agreed to stay two days a week. And then he approached, I think he said to me about 11 other businesses in the same space, in the same sector that he knew and understood, and just reached out to those companies and said, look, I'm in credit control. I know this market. I know it really well. I'm really good at collecting you know, outstanding receivables. Um, do you have any kind of part-time work available for me one or two days a week? And he picked up two other clients who gave him two days a week. And then he got one company that said one day a week. And effectively, to me, he's an entrepreneur because he runs his own business. He works from home. He does all his work on Zoom. And today he's got what I call a lifestyle business. But I was really impressed that how he kind of thought outside the box. He's back in work. He's now got kind of effectively three clients. He's earning a little bit more than he was earning before. But he said to me, I love it because I've got different clients and I'm working in a different situation. He said, financially, it's great because I don't have to commute anymore. I've got no overheads. I do it from home. So I think this is a really interesting time that if you have lost your job, depending on whatever sector you come in, you know, you may find that your employer could afford to keep you maybe one or two days a week. And I think if you stay in the same space, you probably will find that there are companies out there because I can see how an employer might find it awkward to say, look, I can't keep you full time, but what about two days a week? Because, of course, the employer is going to worry, how do you make up your income? So I think this kind of concept of lifestyle businesses, you know, I think is a great idea. Yeah. And, and so Liz asked there, I mean, she's 64. She's just become redundant. It's kind of we don't know what you may make come redundant from, Liz, but the chances that you can find a job, you've got. 40 odd years worth probably of experience uh as sure. adult life either at home or in a career or maybe in several careers we don't know and all of those things contain loads of transferable skills don't they james which you could find a way to market to the right people 100 percent. so i think yeah in whatever she's experienced in and I think for sure, but in addition to that, if, if for the sake of argument, Liz was approaching employees, not necessarily full time, but saying, look, I've got 40 years of wealth and knowledge and experience. I can really add value, you know, in the space that she's targeting in. I think companies would be quite open minded to say, Liz, you know, we'd love to have somebody involved. We can't afford you full time. But how about doing two days a week? And all she really needs is three or four clients to be able to give her one day, two days, three days a week. And this could find herself back in employment, and maybe even earning more than she did before, but with a bit more choice and a bit more variety. And actually, it could be the perfect solution for her. 
Yeah, and remember, Liz, there's lots of companies that want older and more experienced people. So don't let your age be something that holds you back. It's something that holds other people back sometimes, but it shouldn't hold you back. Now, keep asking us your questions, everybody. Um, ask us what you think, you know, James's best advice, some job tips, how to get through interviews. We're going to go through a lot of that stuff. So get into the comments and ask us whatever you would like to ask this ex-Dragon's Den star about how to pitch yourself or your idea, because that's what he's here for. Now, one of the things you um, talk about in your books, James, is trying to work out the difference between a demand and a need and whether your business really has a market and also trying to work out whether it's a hobby or it's a business. Um, and, you know, say if you have an idea to, I don't know, um, set up a plant stall or, or run, start a new mini garden centre or something, is that your hobby because you like gardening or is it actually a business idea and there's a huge demand for it? But presumably, from what you've already said about passion, if it's your hobby and you like it enough, that is the best business idea, isn't it? Yeah, and I think that what I really mean by that is sometimes, to me, it's absolutely okay to have a hobby as a business, as long as you know that's what it is. There's no point in having a hobby of, as a business if you think, you know, you're going to become a global brand, because it probably isn't going to happen. Um, I think when I wrote the book, one of the things that I was talking about, and I think a lot of it was based on my time at Dragon's Den, where... I saw 1,200 entrepreneurs who came and pitched me ideas. And the idea was that normally what happened was people had a great idea and immediately they thought, I don't want to tell anybody because they might copy it. And that's, the unaf to me, your first mistake because I believe that the idea becomes successful because of you. So the fact you happen to tell somebody, I don't think people copy somebody else's passion. So my first advice is if you really have a great idea don't be afraid or embarrassed to talk to somebody about it. When we saw lots of people at Dragon's Den who never discussed it with anybody, what they didn't really know was, was, it really, was there any demand out there? So if I was setting up a business today, I would absolutely go out and talk to as many people as I could because I want to know, is it really got a chance of success? And the more people I speak to, and what I would try and avoid is not speaking to my friends and family because we all know they don't want to upset us and they'll tell us it's great. I want to literally go and talk to people who would be prepared to buy it because that's yeah. when you really get proper advice because people then simply say, you know what, James, it's not for me. Or, you know, it's a bit like when people came to me at Dragon's Den. I wasn't afraid to say, look, thanks, but it's not for me. You know, and I think when if you speak to 20 people and say nobody wants to buy it, there lies the message and what the message is. It's a great idea, but there's just not enough demand. So I think the number of people who I met at Dragon's Den who'd never gone out and spoken to people who would actually buy it, but they still believed it would succeed, that's probably not how to do it. Yeah. Do you market research then and, and research 100%. your market as opposed to research your mates? Um, Correct. Which something my university students have tend to have do when they set up new magazines sometimes as well. Now, Megan asked, and I presume that isn't a picture of Megan, but Megan's daughter, what would you do if you don't know what you want to do? So I think she's asking there, James, if you know, you know you ought to do something, but you don't really have a clear idea of what your dream job might be. How do you find your dream job? I think what you do is you look at your skill set. And what I would do is, you know, what am I good at? What am I, what do I enjoy doing? What are the characteristics of, so I'll give you an example. When I went into recruitment, uh, at the time I was in retail, I was working in a shop. And if you'd asked me the question, what do I want? The truth is, the answer is I didn't know, but it was really interesting. A friend of mine said to me, what do you not want to do? And that was weirdly quite interesting because I thought, actually, I don't want to work, I don't want a job where I stand up all day you know, because I don't, I find it quite difficult, but I do like engaging with people. And it was interesting, recruitment was interesting because you met people every day, you engaged with people every day, but you worked in an office where you sat and it was air conditioning and you'd get a coffee. Whereas, you know, working in a shop, you know, I was just up on my feet all the time. Yeah. I also knew I didn't want to be a rep, so I didn't want to go out traveling from one place to another. So it was interesting when you said to me what don't you want to do i had a whole list of things but i didn't quite know and it was only when i knew what i didn't want to do that recruitment kind of stood out because i thought it works in an office you know it's and also in, in a shop i was working six days a week i didn't have much time off whereas recruitment's five days a week 
I wasn't repping, I wasn't going out and about, people were coming to me. So I suppose, Megan, what might help is if you think about what you don't like, what you don't enjoy, and that might help you narrow the search to find the thing that might suit you. Exactly. I think the other thing I'd say, one other thing, yeah. Megan, is the thing to remember is your first job doesn't always end up being your dream job. I think sometimes you have to try two or three different things to kind of narrow it down. And, you know, and, and it's not, I, I'm, I've been in recruitment all my life, you know, people do move around. Some people do a job and after six months or nine months, it doesn't work out. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just a matter of life. So I think sometimes that trial and error is actually what eventually gets you to exactly what you want to do. Yeah. Would you agree with me then that sometimes getting fired or getting made redundant can be the best possible thing that happens? I think it isn't at the time. I think time it has to, has because, to you, know, you know, I think at the time it probably doesn't feel that way. But it's really, really interesting. I've spoken to loads of people who afterwards realised that it was the kick that they needed to actually, because let's be honest, sometimes you get into a rut and, you know, it's the fear of the unknown. You won't take the risk. But sometimes things happen. I've got a really close friend of mine um, who runs his own business today and he used to work in a company. He always wanted to run his own business, but he was always frightened because he was married, he had a family, he had kids, and he could never take the risk. And somebody made that decision for him by making him redundant. And then he kind of thought, oh my God, now is my chance, now's my opportunity. And today he employs nearly 100 people, runs an amazing business, and you're right, if he hadn't been made redundant, he would never have done it because he was just frightened really to, to take that risk. And, and in his particular situation, somebody made that decision for him. Mm. And re remember, it's character forming as well, getting fired. It's no fun. It's happened to me, but it's, uh, it's character forming. Now, Chloe asks, how would James recommend turning a business idea into a reality? What's the first step in getting an idea off the ground? So Chloe's got a brilliant idea for a new business. What the hell does she do next? She's never set one up before. Obviously, you've written a book about this. <laughs> but So I think, as I said before, Chloe, the first thing I do is I pick 20 people who are not my friends and family and I would go and pitch them the idea and say, look, if I did this, is this something you would buy from me, whether it's a product or a service? And the truth is you will find, because they're not your friends and family, they will tell you very quickly that it's not something they'd be interested in or they'd say, oh my God, that's amazing, Chloe. I wanna be your first customer. So I think the first thing to do is test it to see, does it really have legs? Because if it doesn't, and 20 people say to you, oh, by the way, Chloe, I was offered that before, or I've seen it before, or frankly, I've seen it half the price, you very quickly will know it probably isn't gonna work. So I think going back to what we said earlier, the first thing you wanna do is just to test to see, is there actually a genuine demand? And do people agree with your pricing? Because one of the things that I've come across is people come up with great ideas, but they pr misprice it. And by doing that, nobody's interested. So what mm -hmm. I found is when you get that feedback, people will say to you, oh my God, how much is it? And quickly you realize that you probably have got a great idea, but for example, you know, if it's gonna cost you X to make it, if it's a product, and because you're buying low volumes, you can't buy it cheap enough to make a profit and make it attractive to the consumer. Because the one thing we know today, Chloe, if it is a product, you know, online, people can pretty much buy anything and because the price online has come down so much, there's no point going into business when you're selling something where you don't make enough of a margin that makes you a living. So I think pricing is really important. Exactly. And trying to perhaps if there's if, if your idea is something that other people are doing online, trying to find something unique about what you yeah. can offer uh, that makes it stand out. So Ahmed asked, Mr. Khan, Ahmed, you're so polite. Do you have any advice? <laughs> on writing letters of interest to prospective employers. And this is something I wanted to ask you, James, about because the ebook we're giving away free with you today, have a look in the comments uh, for the links, everybody. Um, but it's mirror.co.uk forward slash Khan job. You can get your free ebook there, but how to get the job you really want. Um, there are people now going for job interviews, James, with a thousand applicants. Um, and the people who are actually there, you know, once they've narrowed it down to 
it's difficult enough to get to interview. But then when you get to interview, you're perhaps going in as a group or you're going in with a dozen other people. How does someone make themselves stand out in that kind of situation when the, the hunt for jobs is so full on? OK, I think, well, firstly, I mean, I think it's a great question. Secondly, download the book, because whilst I'll give you a tip now, but there, there's lots and lots of tips in the book that you will really find invaluable. But to focus on your specific question, in today's market, the first thing I would say is if there is a job available, what that generally means, Ahmed, is there is a problem and filling that job solves the problem. So what I would say to you is try and identify what is that problem. So if we go back to my friend who's in credit control, who effectively chases invoices in, in his job, what he does is he's collecting money on behalf of the company. So they, a company invoices clients for the products and services they do, and clients pay them, and his job is to collect that. So the problem there is that the client has, you know, X thousand invoices they need to collect. So if you were applying for a job, the thing I would say is what is the problem that your position solves? Understand that problem and demonstrate in your covering letter why you are the solution to that problem. So, because I think today what employers really want to know is what are you gonna do that's gonna make a difference? And I would be very specific in my covering letter to say if for the sake of argument it was that position in credit control or I'll give you another one. Let's say you're applying for a job as a PA. You know, a PA generally, uh, that person's job is to make her boss's time more efficient. So what is it that you're going to do that will save me time that means I can be more productive? You know, if you're in credit control, what are you going to do above and beyond that gets those receivables in quicker? What have you done in your past career? So I think in every single job, there's always a problem you are the solution and what i'd like to see in that letter is that you know, your quality is coming forward so i know not only am i getting a great employee but you are going to make a difference and how are you going to do that is i think the key thing that should stand out in the covering letter that's brilliant that's fascinating now one of the things we're going to find in the next few months probably uh, and perhaps even after this, as we continue working from home, which appears to be sort of a, a socioeconomic change that might be here for a long time, is more and more Zoom interviews and people trying to. We've had video interviews been going on for a while anyway, which you mentioned in your book. But if I was doing a Zoom job interview with you now, this is my background. OK, I haven't done anything to change it or prepare it. This happens to be my home study slash nursery with a four-year-old playing in it sometimes so would I get the job is there anything what am I doing wrong here or what am I doing right I mean I think your background reflects what you do and who you are so I think there is a relevance to it but I think not everybody's going to be in that position let's be honest a lot of people are going to be zooming from their kitchen or their bedroom or their living room that's probably more normal so I think in your particular case, you know, I think it's relevant. I think if I was um, giving a general interview, if you're using Zoom, Zoom has what they call virtual backgrounds, and you can simply download, you know, a virtual background. So I think rather, you know, I, literally this morning I did a Zoom call with somebody and she was in her bedroom and I could see lots of clothes hanging, you know, on the door behind her. I, I mean, I didn't think that was great. Now, all she had to do was have a, a drop down screen and it would have looked way more professional. I also think if I'm going to give a Zoom interview, I would still make an effort to dress accordingly because you can't change the reality <laughs> that first impressions count. Yeah. Now, again, you know, to me, you're dressed according to what you do. It's a bit like when you walk into Google, you know, everybody's casual and, you know, it's all very funky and that's really appropriate for that business. But if I was applying for a job in IBM, you know, I wouldn't wear a hoodie, you know, because when you go on to, I mean, one of the, the things I really focus heavily on in the book is, you know, be relevant to the position that you're applying for and the company. So the first thing I always do is I would go to the website of the company. And what I try and understand is what is the culture of that company? So if you go onto IBM's website, you know, most of the images that you see there are people in navy suits, white shirt and dark tie. That's just the culture of the company. If you go into Google, 
you know, it's hoodies, it's sweatshirts, it's more casual. So I think if I'm going to interview somebody, one of the things that's important is what's the cultural fit? You know, do you not just can you do the job, but, you know, are you right culturally for us? So I think, you know, get the right background that's appropriate. I think dress accordingly because first impressions do count. I would definitely do a, you know, a trial with a friend on Zoom because, to be honest, lots of people haven't given interviews for years. And the, if, if your first time you're giving an interview on Zoom, which in itself is hard, you know, I think practice, which is really important. I think the other thing is, you know, when you're, you know, looking at Zoom, you know where the camera is. So it's a bit like if you're sitting in an interview, you should make eye contact. I think if you're giving a Zoom interview, then you should look at the camera because sometimes, you know, people can look around. And again, it just shows that you're probably not concentrating. So I think the same characteristics that we use in real life, I think we should replicate when we're doing Zoom. Yeah. And there's a couple of things I should point out. If I was in a newsroom, I'd be wearing something smart. Because <laughs> <laughs> we always told as journalists, you never know if you might be knocking on a door for someone who's just died or meeting the Queen by the end of the day. So you don't tend to wear a hoodie to the office. And, the other and thing as I'm you know, saying, I wouldn't I wouldn't be wearing a polo shirt as I'm meeting the Queen either. But there you go. The, this is pandemic. It's done it all mm -hmm. to us, isn't it? But the other thing is, if I saw someone and I've done this, when they've got a a, a fake background behind them on a Zoom call, I go, "What are you hiding? Lift, <laughs> lift the sheet up. Take. The, I want to see because it's it makes me suspicious." Um, but that's just me. Now, Amy asks, and keep asking us your questions, everybody. James is here. He's going to give you job tips or how to have your own business. Anything you've got to ask him, feel free. Dig into the comments and ask what you can. And Amy says, what if you want to start your own business, but you haven't had your first job yet? This is the first foray into the job market. And it's she wants to go for the, for the big goal straight away. Is that a wise idea or should she try to get a job first? I think my, I, it's, firstly, Amy, I think it's a great question because I'm sure it's a question a lot of people have asked. I think when I was in exactly the same position, Amy, I knew that I quite liked recruitment, but I had never worked in recruitment before. So I decided that I should really work in recruitment first because sometimes if you start a business without really knowing how the business works, I think it becomes quite difficult. So in my own personal situation, I worked in recruitment first. Um, I got an idea of whether it really suited me, whether I really liked it. And sometimes you just don't know until you try something. And, you know, so I worked in the business for about two years um, before I realized that really this is something I want to do for myself. Um, so my advice to you would be is I would get a job first in that particular market or industry, just to be honest, Amy, to find out, is it really what you want to do? Good advice. Now, we're going to have just one more question before we have to let James go about his business for the day. Now, just a reminder, you can download his ebook on how to get your dream job at mirror.co.uk forward slash Khan job. The link is in the ticker at the bottom of the screen. And tomorrow from midnight, there'll be another link for his other ebook about how to set up a business in seven days. So keep your eye on the Daily Mirror Facebook page for that. Now, finally, James, there's something I spotted in one of your books, which is about how to give interviews. And one of the interesting tips you have is to make tell people to stay professional until they've left the building. Only relax, you say, when you're out of sight and out of earshot, which is when you start swearing, wiping the sweat away, punching, saying, out, yeah. sobbing, whatever it might be. Now, what made you write that? It sounds like there's a story behind that that makes you th that you've seen that or done that or witnessed it somehow. Um, I'll tell you um, why I, uh, first is I think it's a great question. The reason what made me write that, I remember when I was in recruitment, I sent somebody for an interview and they did really well and the employer loved them and they were going to make them a job offer. And as it happens quite a lot in interviews, when you wrap up, sometimes the person interviewing you actually walks you, you know, to the lift or to the door or whatever the case is. And the client said to me, you know what, she did really well, it was great. And then as we were walking down, you know, she made a couple of comments that really, you know, threw me. And I was like, really? And I was like, oh my God, what did you do? So that was really the thing that stuck in my head at the time, is you shouldn't relax until you literally leave the building. Because literally in her particular case, 
just the journey between the office and the door, she blew it because she let her guard down. And I don't know what she said because he wouldn't tell me, but I can imagine sometimes (laughs) it's because what happens, you know, it's like friendly banter and, you know, God knows what she said, but it kind of blew it. And when I was writing the book, it just made me realise that, you know, don't drop your guard because even when you're walking from the office to the lift or the lift to the door, you are still in the interview. Yeah. And that's don't come out of the interview and think they're just walking you to the lift and suddenly reveal you about your plans to go to a rave at the weekend. If you think the person you're talking to is going to prefer you not to go to a rave at weekends, perhaps. Who sure. knows? Something like that. Now, Charlotte asks, I'd love to start a business, but it kind of requires money. And uh, national minimum wage and universal credit don't work. Never mind someone who hasn't got a job and never had one. So someone who's on benefits, someone who's living hand to mouth, someone who doesn't have seed cash to invest, how could she start a business? Uh, uh, Charlotte, the, the one place I would definitely, definitely go to is Prince's Trust. So Prince's Trust do exactly that. They absolutely help people like yourself and have helped nearly 40,000 people to start a business who never had any seed capital. And in some cases, Charlotte, didn't even have a job um, previously. So my recommendation is that I've done a lot of work with the Prince's Trust. They're an amazing organization. They help literally thousands of people up and down the country, and they're designed to do exactly what you're looking for. So my recommendation would be the Prince's Trust. Okay, great. There you go, Charlotte. I hope this wasn't a waste of time for you to come in and ask the question. You can go and get some help at the Prince's Trust for your brilliant ideas. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, James, for joining us and giving us some of your tips. Don't forget, you can download a fuller version of everything that he said and loads of other tips we haven't had time to talk about at mirror.co.uk forward slash Khan job. There'll be another link for another ebook later on tonight. So keep an eye on the daily news page. I think the most important thing is to remember. It's free. So you can download it free of charge. It's my way of giving back to help you to make sure that if you're going to start the business, it's going to succeed. And if you're going to get a job, every bit of advice that you need, you'll find in in the book. And it's free from me to you. There you go. How often do you get something free from a dragon, everybody? You can't reject it now. You can't turn it down. Go and download it and we'll all benefit from it hugely, I'm sure. Thank you for your time, James. We'll let you go and have your lunch now and I'm going to go and have mine. And thanks for popping in, everybody. See you next time. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye.